Okay, should we get started? So, uh, last time um, we talked a little bit about what the uh, present situation is, the fact that we can, with the Higgs, we can extrapolate uh, our understanding of, uh, of the interactions we have to exponentially high energies. Um, I also started uh, uh, reviewing what some of the reasons are that we s suspect we might be missing um, some major principles and uh, uh, especially associated um, with the question of why the world around us is big, why there's any macroscopic structure at all. Um, and we uh, quickly talked about the idea of naturalness going into it a little bit more uh, detail and fleshing out some of the points that uh, Nati made already in his introductory lecture and ending with the statement that if, if naturalness is correct, we have to see colored particles that are lighter than around 400 GeV to be some kind of partner of the top quark minimally <laughs> to get rid of that largest uh, uh, quadratic sensitivity uh, to the Higgs mass associated with the top. And next lecture, I'm going to come back to these questions uh, and the question of whether naturalness is right, wrong, something in between, and we'll talk about those implications further. But yesterday was uh, setting the stage for, uh, for what the questions are, that, that uh, the really big questions are that we hope to address with the LHC. And today I want to switch gears. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, I'm gonna go back and forth. And today I mostly wanna tell you about the collider physics of the LHC, okay? And, um, and uh, we already have, uh, we're going to have some wonderful, uh, more detailed lectures about all the things that I'm going to tell you about. So really what I wanna do in the first part is just give you a very broad brush, super zeroth order uh, uh, picture uh, for, uh, for, for LHC collider physics. And in the second part of the talk, uh, I want to spend some time just going through one example of uh, one, of the, uh, you know, one of the most salient features of life at the LHC. So we have these colored particles, they come screaming in, they bang into each other, other colored particles go screaming out. And so we have, it's a the, the strong interaction, it's a very messy environment, all of this is very famous, there are jets coming out all over the place. There is a hell of a lot of radiation. <laughs> So what I want to do is just work through one very elementary example in a context, it's not the, it's not the LHC, it doesn't have the additional complications of color, um, uh, but uh, it's just the physics of ordinary classical radiation. <laughs> when you have a bunch of particles coming in, banging into each other, going out. This is such a simple and nice problem, it's possible to understand it in an hour start to end. Uh, and all these words that you may have heard of that maybe some of you are scared of, Sudakov, double logarithms, all that kind of stuff, it's all just trivial classical radiation. And we can understand it and, uh, and digest all of it in this very simple setting where you can even see what things like in, look like in position space, it's very intuitive. Um, so that later when uh, uh, you see fancier versions of these things that also include the effects of splitting and all sorts of other stuff, uh, at least uh, the simplest part of it you have under your belt's cold. Okay. okay, so those are the two things I wanna do in this lecture, but part one is, uh, is just uh, LHC super basics. All right, so the most basic of all, proton-proton collisions, that much you know. Uh, and the center of mass energy, well, it's supposed to be 14 TV, but let's uh, call it 13, which is what it's going to be when we turn back on again. All right, now, what is the TeV scale? One TeV inverse is around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, okay? So that's uh, part of the conversion you all know by heart. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, now, the luminosity that we're going to have at the LHC is about 10 to the 34 per centimeter squared per second. And you can ask, who decided that number 10 to the 34 per centimeter squared per second? Why 10 to the 34 and not some other number? Well, that has everything to do with the size of the cross-sections that we're trying to probe. Okay, so 
there's a very deep formula for the number of events that you make per unit time. The number of events per time is the luminosity multiplied by the cross-section of the process. <laughs> All right. Now, what's the typical cross-sections that we're interested in at the LHC? Well, it's the TEV scale. So let's, let's say that uh, we have some strong interactions. I don't know, you have like some, some quarks in and some gluons out, it's a, but it's a perturbative process of coming out at big angles. So typical cross-section should be at TeV energies, let's say alpha strong squared over a TeV squared, okay? So one over a TeV squared is 10 to the minus 34 centimeters squared. Alpha strong is a tenth. So this is about 10 to the minus 36 centimeters squared. All right, now, for just some words for uh, someone's idea of a joke back in the 1940s, uh, the number of order 10 to the minus 27 centimeters squared, which is about the area of a proton, okay? The size of the proton is a little bigger than 10 to the minus 14 centimeters, so the area, the cross-sectional area is around 10 to the minus 27 centimeters squared. So this is proton size squared, roughly speaking. Well, someone, I guess back then, said that hitting a proton is so easy, it's like hitting a barn. <laughs> Okay, so that's why these things are called barns, or this is actually a milli barn. I guess it's a little bit harder than hitting a barn, okay? So a milli barn is 10 to the minus 27 centimeters. And I don't know about you, but I, I never remember any of these stupid SI units. So milli, I know what, what it is. Mu, I even know what it is, but then I get confused. Nano, barn, so that's 10 to the three, uh, sorry, micro barn, then another 10 to the three is nano barn. Then there's pico barn and femto barn. And I have no idea what a pico or a femto is, although I, I guess I could figure it out <laughs> from here. But anyway, pico barn is 10 to the minus 36 centimeters squared. Femto barn is around 10 to the minus 39 centimeters squared. Okay? So, and these are the typical cross sections that we're interested in for new physics at the LHC, kind of in this range pico barn to femto barn. All right. <clears throat> now, let's compare those cross-sections that we're interested in, just, just so you have some idea, with some of the other cross-sections. So what is the total cross-section? What's the total event rate? Uh, not, not the cross-section, what, what, what's actually the, the total event rate? Just the two protons banging into each other. Well, it's that formula, sigma times L, with the sigma of around 10 to the minus 27 centimeters squared. Anyway, if you uh, put it all in, we get something like, the total rate is something like 10 to the nine events per second. Okay, bigger than that. The TT bar cross-section. Okay, so, so that's a nice strongly interacting particle. This is around 1,000 picobarn. And this would around 10 events per second. So you think about that. You, uh, in 1995, 14 top quarks were made, and uh, you know, it was the discovery of the decade f for particle physics, and now we make 10 of them every second, or we're gonna make 10 of them every second at the LHC. Um, the, the rate for making just a single W or Z is around 100,000 picobarn. So that's 1,000 per second. Uh, Di boson, let's say WW, is around 100 picobarn. So that's an amount of event a second. And if we're lucky and we're making SUSY at the TeV scale, those cross sections, as I said, are about a picobarn. And this is about an event per minute. So that's nice, that's a nice human time scale, one event a minute, you know, you wait a year, that's a nice number of events uh, to look at and study. And that's why you work so hard, but that's where that 10 to the 34 comes from, right? You know, so there's a cross section you're trying to get, and you try to make the luminosity high enough that you don't have to wait a year before anything interesting happens, you know, that you can collect enough events that, uh, that life is interesting. Okay, so those are the uh, typical 
cross sections. And of course, there's the famous fact that we'll, you'll be hearing about more in other lectures. This is much, much, much smaller rate than all the other things that we're talking about. So we have to have a good understanding of the backgrounds uh, in order to be able to get rid of them and pick out the needle uh, of new physics out of the uh, haystack of the standard model backgrounds. Okay. Now, let's go back and talk um, about uh, the actual collision process. Maybe I should do it like this. I don't like using these non-middle boards so much. But it's not. All right, so in this proton-proton uh, collision, um, of course we know the thing that we're interested in is the collision between the underlying partons inside each proton. So now we're talking about the uh, parton model. Um, so imagine so you're going to imagine there's some parton a, species A in the proton here, and of species B in the proton here. <clears throat> and amongst other things, what this means is that we don't know what the center of mass, we know the center of mass of the collision of the two protons, but we don't know the center of mass of the hard collisions between the partons that we care about. Okay? So, uh, so something which is useful to do is to, uh, before getting started, is to just uh, use variables where we don't know what the center of mass is, but we know that wherever it is is somewhere in the z direction. Let's say this is the beam direction is the z direction. So it's just useful to, to use variables where boosts along the z direction are as manifest as possible. because That's one of the symmetries of our problem. So we'll divide things, of course, with the momenta that are moving in the z direction. So we have all momenta have a zero component, a z component, and two components that are transverse, but it's convenient to use light cone variables in this direction. So let's define P plus minus to be P0 plus minus PZ. These variables are useful because under boosts, under boosts in the Z direction, P plus minus goes to E to the plus minus, I don't know, eta P plus minus. So we don't have koshas and cinches like you normally do with Lorentz transformations. You just have e to the plus or minus eta. Okay. All right. And just to remind you, if we if we use these light cone variables, if I have any two vectors a and b, a dot b is a half a plus b minus plus a minus b plus minus a transpose. Uh, sorry, a transverse dot b transverse. And of course, p squared itself is p plus p minus minus p transverse squared. <coughs> so if we have a particle that has mass m, um, we, we learn, of course, is equal to m squared. So p plus p minus itself is m squared plus p transverse squared. And this is often called the transverse energy. So anything that you make out of just the transverse variables is called transverse. And furthermore, almost always from now on, I'll probably drop the T when I write ET. So when I say energy, think of it as transverse energy, unless I say otherwise. So this also tells us that P plus, because the product is ET, I can write, uh, let me write this, let me get a little bigger here. I can write P plus as ET, E to the Y, P minus is ET, e to the minus y. And the y is a nice variable because now y just translates under boosts in z. So under boosts in z, y goes to y plus eta. y is called the rapidity. Okay, and again, what's nice is it just translates under boosts, under z boosts. 
And it's also a measure of angle, right? So obviously y equals zero corresponds to 90 degree scattering, right? So y equals zero is 90 degree scattering. As y gets bigger and bigger in magnitude, positive or negative, it's scattering this more and more forward. And just to have a figure of merit, if you want to have, uh, uh, for very relativistic particles, if we can ignore the m, for, relati for very relativistic particles, y of around 3.5 is uh, something moving at an angle of 10 degrees or so. All right. And the final bit of uh, trivial kinematics here is to write the Lorentz invariant phase space for one particle. The Lorentz invariant phase space, I can write as D4P with the mass shell condition that P squared is equal to M squared, okay? Well, D4P is also a half D plus, D, DP plus, DP minus, D squared, P transverse, and this is delta of P plus, P minus, minus E transverse squared. <coughs> and I don't know, if I write P plus is equal to rho E to the Y and P minus, before the mass shell condition is rho E to the minus Y, then DP plus, DP minus, sorry, this is a little messy, DP plus D minus is just D rho squared DY. Okay, that's just uh, like polar coordinates. So this just fixes rho squared. So this is D rho squared DY. That just fixes rho squared, so that's gone. So this just goes to DY D squared P transverse. Okay, so that's the other nice thing about the rapidity is that the phase space is just linear and is just dy. Okay. So the phase space is dy d squared p transpose. Okay. So now let's uh, talk about the parton model in a little more detail. So let's say I have a process where these underlying partons A and B, now the idea is that this parton A carries a fraction XA. This is the fraction of momentum carried by A, and we have the analog over here, XB. And let's say the underlying process we're interested in is AB goes in general to one, two, up to N, whatever it is. And this has some amplitude, uh, well, let's say some spin average amplitude, m mod squared, uh, for a, b to 1, 2, up to n. Then the actual differential cross-section, differential with respect to every uh, variable that matters, is integrating the x's from 0 to 1 times something that tells you the probability to find uh, each parton carrying that fraction of the momentum of the proton. So these are the famous uh, uh, PDFs, parton distribution functions that I'm sure will be talked about more by other lecturers as well. We'll say a little bit qualitative things about it too. Okay, times, well, this, this, the cross-section for this elementary process, so between the partons, so there's the cross-section. So SAB is just PA plus PB squared. And then we have the, uh, then we have the delta function for momentum conservation. Uh, momentum conservation just says that XA, this guy carries the fraction XA of the first uh, of the first proton plus XB of the second proton, and then minus P1 plus Pn. That's momentum conservation, and we have the phase space for all of the outgoing uh, particles, which we've just worked out. So it's dy1 d squared P1 up to dyn d squared Pn. So the these are now the uh, 
transverse skies. Okay, very good. All right, so in, in our light cone coordinates, P1, so let me now work in units where the center of mass energy is one. We can restore it trivially later. So P, P1 is like one, zero, zero. P2 is zero, one, zero. So we can just do the integral over the x's trivially because the, uh, we just use the delta function to solve for xa and xb from this component and that component. Okay. And if we do that, we get uh, the final answer that d sigma is fa at xa fb at xb, m mod squared ab 1n over sab, and then product of this phase space, where xa is equal to the sum of ej e to the yj and xb is a sum of ej e to the minus yj, okay? All right, that's our master formula. Um, now let's specialize to the case of two to two scattering. So let's say it's two to two scattering, so n just runs from one to two. <coughs> then the, uh, then the invariant mass of the two particles going out is the same as the two partons going in, so it's just SAB. The invariant mass of the two particles going out is something you might imagine measuring. Okay, so that gives us a handle on what the invariant mass of the two guys going in was. So let's write what is S. S in these units is just, you know, it's XP1 plus uh, XAP1 plus XBP2 squared, so it's just XA, XB. And we know what xa and xb are from that formula, just e1 e to the y1 plus e2 e to the y2 times the other way around for that guy. So this is just e1 squared plus e2 squared plus 2e1 e2 cosh y1 minus y2. You can work out what the, uh, what the uh, t Mandelstam invariant is. I'll just write out the answer. It's minus pt squared plus E1, E2. So notice that the, uh, the, the PT of the second particle has got to be opposite to the PT of the first particle, so there's just one PT. So it's just that PT squared plus E1, E2, E to the Y2 minus Y1. And so one nice thing you notice, which is just a trivial consequence of boost invariance, is that this thing depends on the y's only through y1 minus y2, because that's the only combination which is Lorentz invariant, because the y's shift under boosts. So this depends on delta y, and it depends on pt. And so let's now write the formula for two to two in more detail. So d sigma is fa of xa, fb of xb, that's m mod squared over sab, is just xa, xb that we just wrote out. And the, the, the phase space at the end is dy1, dy2, and just d squared of just one pt. Because, the, like I said, the second pt is just opposite to the first pt and is nailed by the delta function. All right. All right, and this combination I can, uh, I can rewrite. Let me just quickly rewrite it as dy bar, if you like, d delta y, where y bar is the average and delta y is the difference. Now, you notice that because s also depends on the difference, uh, I can trade my variables from pt, y bar, and delta y, I can trade them to, let's say, pt, y bar, and s. And that's useful because, again, S is something that I can, I can measure from, from the final state. So let me just do that. Let me change variables from uh, PT, Y bar, and delta Y to PT, Y bar, and S. And that's just, that's a homework exercise for 
you or Mathematica is to work out the Jacobian. So dy bar d delta y d squared pt is equal to dy bar ds d squared pt divided by the square root of s minus e1 minus e2 squared times s minus e1 plus e2 squared. Okay, so that's the Jacobian. And so we have our final formula now in, uh, in terms of very useful variables, uh, directly in terms of s. Well, so let me actually write it down, further specialize to so the case where, let me further specialize the case where the two masses are equal to each other. The masses of the two particles coming out, maybe they're both massless, maybe they're pair production of one massive particle, just so I have a little, uh, fewer formulas to write down. And so then I have the final expression is d sigma is dy bar ds d squared pt over root, and the Jacobian, the first term simplifies because e1 is equal to e2, and I have s minus 4e squared, and I just have m mod squared, which spends on s and pt over s, and I have fa of root s e to the y bar, and fb of root s e to the minus y bar. All right. So obviously the only thing here that depends on y bar, depends on this average rapidity, is are the, are the PDFs, right? So uh, I'm not going to measure that. So if I integrate over the y bars, I get a distribution only on things that I can actually measure out the end, right? Which are s and pt. And so what I finally get is a useful expression. This is all trivial, of course, but it's good to uh, do it explicitly so we can see some things. Um, so I get the final expression that d sigma is ds d squared pt over root s, s minus 4 e squared, the basic cross section, m squared over s, and then there's something that you can call the parton luminosity. It's called the parton luminosity you, because it's, anyway, for obvious reasons, it's called the parton luminosity. What is a parton luminosity? Well, it's just the integral rho AB of S is just the integral over the Y bars of FA root S e to the Y bar, FB root S e to the minus Y bar. Okay, beautiful. So that's just, uh, that's just the trivial pushing around uh, formulas. But now comes the important part. The important part is what these parton distribution functions actually look like, right? And what these luminosities look like. And the crucial point is that these f's, as you go to smaller and smaller x, uh, the f's, so if, if you make, roughly speaking, up to logarithms, if you make x, you know, 10 times smaller, f gets 10 times bigger. f is very rapidly, f is very, very rapidly increasing as you go to smaller and smaller x. The physics of that, which uh, I'm sure Michelangelo will uh, talk about more, has to do with the fact that, you know, we don't have this picture that the proton is just uh, two up quarks and a down quark sitting there. Uh, uh, there's, depending on the scale with which you probe the system, they're constantly splitting, 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 uh, and so really, as you go to lower and lower x, you get vastly more and more partons that carry less and less, a smaller and smaller fraction of the momentum of the proton. 
So, uh, so a picture, uh, I'm sure Michelangelo will draw you a picture of what the PDFs look like, but just a cartoon of what the PDFs look like is something like this. So here it's conventional to plot x times f of x. x times f of x is like, is more of a momentum fraction. x times f of x, the vertical axis will just go to numbers kind of order one, but the important point is the horizontal axis, we start with x of one, it'd be 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three, and so on. And now all these things, of course, should go to zero above x equals one, so everything goes to zero at x equals one. So, but what does the PDF look like, let's say, for the, for the up quark? PDF for the up quark looks something like this. Okay, I'm exaggerating a little. Oh, well, okay, it's just gonna be a cartoon. Okay. The PDF for the down quark looks something like this. Down here is where you roughly have the picture that the proton is two up quarks and a down quark, <laughs> okay? So that's why it's more likely to find an up quark than a down quark. So around here is where you have the approximate idea of the proton being made out of two up quarks and a down quark. But as you go to smaller x, the picture changes. For example, there's anti-down. Okay, there's no anti-down in the proton naively, but of course we know it's, it's there because of all these splittings. So anti-down is starting zero, it's small, but all these things catch up. Okay, anti-down and anti-up uh, all look like that. In fact, all the, all the quarks, quarks or anti-quarks is sufficiently small x, uh, have the same PDF. And the reason is by the time you, you kept emitting these gluons that split and split and split, at some point you can't distinguish the valence quarks from these, uh, from, from all the ones that are generating by this uh, splitting process. Anyway, so this asymptote, I forget, maybe this is point, point 0.7 or something like that, point 0.7, point 0.8. The gluons look like this. Actually, the gluons get really big, so on these plots, for some reason, people plot gl uh, the gluon PDF divided by 10. But the gluon PDF divided by 10 looks something like, like this. Okay, so, so they really uh, become very important at small x. But the strange is sitting here. It also starts small, but the strange is there. Even the charm is sitting there. They, they, they come out, you know. Uh, all these numbers are sort of order one there. Anyway, so that's what, the, that's what the PDFs look like. There's a lot of physics that goes into that that uh, you'll hear more about. But the zeroth order point is that there's vastly more uh, partons with even a modest fraction of the momentum of the proton than there are a few with a large fraction of the momentum of the proton. And that's the single biggest difference between uh, between just the zeroth order physics of collisions at a hadron collider than at an E plus E minus collider. And it gives rise to uh, a lot of uh, the, the very zeroth order uh, dramatic and important uh, features of collider physics at the LHC. So those are what the PDFs themselves look like. What do these parton luminosities look like? Well, for the same reason, these parton luminosities are dropping like a rock, okay? The parton luminosities scale roughly like one over s, uh, uh, like one over s squared, I think, as you go to higher s. Okay, so rho goes like one over s squared or so. And in, in more detail, um, you know, at the kind of energies that we care about at the LHC, uh, the quark gluon so it depends on rho AB. So when, when AB is a light quark and a gluon, uh, or two gluons, they are kind of comparable. The quark gluon's a little bigger than the two gluon. Uh, and the QQ bar is maybe about a factor of five smaller. Okay, so that's the remnant of there being no <laughs> anti-quarks in the, in the proton. It's not there are no anti-quarks, but there's still, it, it, it's enough that there's maybe about a factor of five uh, factor of five splitting between these guys. So most collisions at the LHC are quark gluon or gluon gluon initiated, and you know, a factor of five fewer or so are, are uh, QQ bar. All right, so what does this imply? This has, uh, what do these two facts imply? Let's go back and look at our, uh, let's go back and look at our formula, okay? So 
suppose that we are producing, suppose that we're producing uh, a resonance. Okay, let's say we're, let's say we're making a resonance. If we're making a resonance, uh, so, that, so the particle has some mass, capital M, that means that this m mod squared, you can roughly approximate just as a delta function, delta of s minus m squared, up to some constant, right? So this tells you that sigma total for producing a resonance goes like one over the mass squared of the particle times rho AB at m squared, right? And remember I told you this rho AB of m squared is going roughly like one over m to the fourth. So this is going like one over m to the sixth, roughly. That means that the cross section for resonant production of some particle is dropping like a rock as a function of the mass of the particle. There's one piece, which is the one that you maybe expect. There's an overall one over m squared from the naive size of the cross section, but there's the extra fact that, uh, that depending on, anyway, there's the, there's the extra fact having to do with the uh, PDF. So, that, uh, so now let's say, uh, let's say we have uh, heavy particle pair production, not resonant production. Then once again, the fact that this is dropping like a rock tells you something interesting. If you're very naive, you would think, I don't know, you're colliding these particles at, let's say you're making top quarks, right? You would think you're colliding these particles at like a, a few TeV, the top quarks are gonna come screaming out at huge, at huge uh, uh, gammas, right? Because the TeV over 175 GeV is a large number. But it's not true. Uh, heavy particles are largely produced at threshold, okay? They're largely produced at threshold because uh, because you gain, because that row is dropping like a rock, and so this thing is just dominated at the smallest s it can possibly go to and still make the particle, okay? So heavy particles are typically produced near threshold. That's another very big difference between hadron colliders and E plus E minus machines, okay? In fact, you can quantify that a little bit. Actually, you can use these, these, these formulas to derive for yourself, and it's another little nice exercise that the kind of typical value of the PT squared relative to the mass squared of a heavy particle for heavy particle production is around a third if it's glue-glue initiated, let's say about a half if it's uh, uh, QQ-bar initiated. But anyway, the, uh, the uh, typical PTs, that quantifies the degree to which they're made at threshold, okay? So the betas that are coming out are like 0.7, okay? All right. And also, for exactly the same reason as the scaling that we're talking about, uh, the cross-section for pair production is falling like a high power of the mass of the particles, right? So, one over m to the five, one over m to the sixth, or thereabouts, again, depending on exactly how it's initiated. So, if you've seen plots like this before, for, you know, typical SUSY cross-sections at the, at the LHC, you can now understand them a little bit better. So a typical SUSY production cross-section at the LHC, let's say we're talking about gluinos, okay? If we're talking about gluinos, I don't know, let me put 500 GeV here and two TeV up there. So it looks like a measly range of energies, but even over this measly range of energies, it can go from like 100 picobarn to a femtobarn, or even less than a femtobarn, be 10 to the minus one femtobarn, again, it's dropping like a rock, okay? They, they look like that. The cross-sections that we care about at the LHC can scan over a factors of war over a million or so uh, because of this PDF effect, largely. All right? <clears throat> but those are the kind of cross-sections that we talk about for colored particles. And just for, for comparison, if I take some uncolored particles, like, like a Wino, they're roughly speaking a factor of a hundred to a thousand smaller, okay? So the LHC is a hundred to a thousand times more powerful at making colored particles than uncolored particles, right? That hundred to a thousand, part of it is n color alpha strong squared versus alpha weak squared, okay? So that's about a factor of 30. And and another factor of five to 10 of it is that uh, the strong production can be uh, initiated by quarks and gluons or gluons and gluons, uh, whereas uh, electroweak has got to go through QQ bar and that pays this other factor of five to 10 in the PDFs that we're talking about, okay? 
So the reach for colored particles, you know, we, we might see gluinos up to two or three TeV at the LHC, but if the Wino is 500 GeV, uh, at least direct production of it without some extra handle that, that, that you've seen it will be very difficult. Okay. So uh, this is also why, uh, this is also why this jump going to a factor of two higher in energy is such a big deal, right? I say, if you're very naive, you say, a factor of two, why is that so exciting? Well, for exactly the same reasons, if you want to produce particles of the same mass, the scaling with center of mass energy is that the rate goes up roughly by the center of mass energy to the fifth or the sixth, <laughs> okay? Um, and so this factor of two in energy is buying us a factor of 100 in the rate, <laughs> roughly speaking. And that's why it's such a big deal. That's why th th that, coupled with the fact that you're going to collect a lot more data, means that what's coming uh, in the next run is, you know, a different animal entirely than what we've seen so far. It's not just a little different. It's, you know, three orders of magnitude or more different than what we've seen and more powerful than what we've seen so far. Okay. Any questions about that? Yes. Sorry? Uh, yeah, I think it's. Uh, no, 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 that, 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 that's, that's E squared. You remember, I set the center of mass energy to one. The center of mass energy is one. So you have to put it back to restore units. Maybe that's not what, what you're asking. No, what, what I wrote is correct. Okay, so let's now move on to the second topic. I'm going a little more slowly than I wanted, but I want to do this before Michelangelo's lecture. All right, so looking in a little bit more detail, we collide these partons, and what comes out is complicated mass of strongly interacting particles, jets, there's hadronization, showering, hadronization, all these words that you've heard about. And so what I want to do is cover a slightly simpler example where not all of the physics shows up, but some of it shows up and you already get a feeling for the, at least some of the sorts of things that we're going to see. In particular, the importance of soft and collinear Singularities, Sudikov factors, all of that jazz. We can understand already from this example. So, so forget about the LHC. We're, uh, we're, we're actually thinking about just a very simple question. Imagine, just for really great simplicity, imagine that some event take place here. It's some time t equals zero. Everything is quiet. Then all of a sudden some bomb goes off and screaming out, of the origin is a whole bunch of charged particles, okay? And the charged particles have some charge qj, and they're moving with some four velocities vj mu, right? So by the very act of drawing this picture, there's a little point-like region here and I'm saying I'm just ignoring, uh, I'm just looking at things on long scales compared to whatever the scales of uh, what went on there were. So there's some hard scale that produced this thing. I'm just looking at longer distances, lower energies, and uh, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just looking at that. All right, and the trajectories of all these particles are just xj of mu is, well, just vj vt for tau runs from zero to infinity. All right. The first question I want to ask is, this is clearly going to produce some radiation pattern, right? Those charges are really accelerating. They weren't there before, and then they're, they're, they're produced. So, so we're definitely going to get some radiation pattern from this. And I just want to ask, what does that radiation pattern look like? And I'm going to solve this problem in first just classically. We're going to look at it, and we're going to solve it in position space, okay? We're really going to see what it actually looks like. It's extremely simple. Um, First, let's work out what are all the currents, okay? Uh, well, the current for any, the space-time current is a sum over all of these j's of an integral over this world line, qj, the velocity, 
delta of x minus vj of tau, right? That's just saying that the current is a delta function sitting on top of the moving charge, right? So in order to find, remember, what I'm trying to do is I, I want to solve for the electromagnetic field, so I'm trying to solve box A mu equals J mu in Feynman gauge, let's say, right? So, so, uh, so I can do this trivially in, if I'm in momentum space, I would write that down. We've got to be careful about what kind of propagator is and so on, but that'll all work out in a second. We can be sloppy about it, okay? Um, <coughs> right now. Uh, so let's work out what this J looks like in momentum space, all right? So let's just Fourier transform this guy. So J tilde mu of K, well, it's just integral d4x e to the i kx uh, times this J mu of x, which is particularly easy to do because it just localizes to those delta functions. So this is the sum over J qj, and I'm just left with the integral over tau now, from zero to infinity, zero to infinity, e to the i k dot vj tau, d tau. And this integral is just one over i k dot vj. So this is the sum over j, uh, oh sorry, I had my vj mu, the sum over j qj vj mu over i k dot vj, right? So that's j mu in momentum space. Okay, and so if I want to go back to position space, <coughs> then a mu of x is just the integral d d k, uh, d four k, e to the minus i k x <coughs> times that thing, sum of q j v j mu over i k dot v j, one over k squared. That's the sum over j, right? Now, in principle, we can just do this Fourier transform back. And it's very simple because uh, we, we can just do it using poles. That has poles, that has poles. We have to remember, we have to remember that was the retarded propagator. So there's some I epsilon prescription here. There's some I epsilon prescription for that one and we can just do it and get the answer. But we can actually do it a little more simply than that without worrying about it uh, so much. Uh, let's just, to find the contribution from one J, let's just go to the frame where that guy's at rest. In the frame where that guy's at rest, obviously only A0 is non-zero, right? Only A0 is non-zero in that frame, and furthermore, if I differentiate A0 with respect to time, what am I gonna get? If I differentiate A0 with respect to time, I just kill that pole, and what I get is just a Fourier transform of one over K squared. Well, that's just the retarded propagator, right? So in the frame where Vj is at rest, We just have A0, and what I know is that D0 of A0 in that frame is just the retarded propagator times those Q factors. So we'll put the Q factors in in a, uh, in a, in, in a second. Uh, so, um, and what is the retarded propagator? Well, that's just the theta function of time, so theta of T, and just uh, a delta of X squared, right? So delta of t squared minus r squared. So this is uh, one over r delta of t minus r. Okay, so that's what the derivative of the, uh, that's what the derivative of a is. So let's integrate. So what is a zero itself? Just the integral with respect to time of that, that's easy enough. So a zero is just one over r step function, theta of t minus r. And so, so we can skip all the epsilonology and just write that down. 
And now we can also uh, work out what is the, what is f mu nu, right? What's the field strength associated with that? Obviously, the only component of the field strength that's interesting is the electric field. So let's look at F0i. F0i is uh, just di a0. And di a0 has the one where the ddxi hits the 1 over r and the ddxi hits that. So remember, ddxi of 1 over r is just xi over r squared, right? So F0i has two terms, the one where it hits that. The one where it hits that looks like xi over r cubed theta of t minus r. And it has another piece where it hits the other guy, and that gives me xi over r squared delta of t minus r. All right. So that's what I have in this frame for the contribution from that particle. And now, we can immediately recognize these two terms. What is this term? That term is just the Coulomb potential localized inside the light cone, right? So this first term is the Coulomb potential. That's not going to be interesting. It's not going to give us energy transfer out to large distances, right? The second term is going to be interesting. The second term, you see it's more dominant than the first, oh, anyway. This doesn't carry energy, this one does. And this is localized right on the light cone. So this is the radiation. That piece is the radiation. So in fact, I can then immediately write that the f mu nu now in any frame is, there's one piece that I won't even write, it's just the f mu nu for Coulomb localized inside the light cone. But there's the interesting part, which is the f mu nu for the radiation. And what is the f mu nu for the radiation? Well, we worked it out what it is in this frame. In this frame, it looks like xi over r squared, but there's a unique way of lifting that to something that's valid in any frame. It's just a delta of x squared, or a delta plus of x squared, if you like, saying that time is positive, okay? Times the sum over j, qj, and instead of just having xi here, we have uh, vj mu xj nu minus vj mu xj nu. It's got to be anti-symmetric in mu and nu. Oh, sorry, over x dot v. All right. So this is the radiation part of the field. Okay. Each guy has this vx anti-symmetrized over x dot v. So we'll examine that in a second, but let me quickly remove one small restriction on what we did. Uh, in the problem that we did, we assumed that there was a, just a bomb that went off at the origin, right? So there was nothing before, and then all of a sudden there are all these particles coming out. What if we have the slightly different problem, where we had a bunch of, problem, bunch of particles coming in, scattering, and then a bunch of particles going out, right? Well, these two problems are actually the same. We've solved the second problem as well. The way to think about it is imagine the particles that were coming in, right? Imagine just taking their world lines and continuing them, continuing them as if there was no collision at all, right? So I want to solve the problem. Let's say here are these two guys in, and here are two guys out. So this is in and out. But just imagine extending these world lines for a second like that, okay? And now what I'm going to do is say that what is the charge? What is the current? The current is what I would have gotten if I, I just imagined that these things sailed through all the time and I add a negative image charge moving in exactly the same direction here and there, right? Now these two things differ by something. What do they differ by? They just differ by the Coulomb, by the Coulomb potential of that sailing along charge. So as far as the radiation is concerned, it's no different. They only differ by those uh, Coulomb bits. If you care about the radiation pattern, the radiation pattern for two particles coming in and two particles coming out is exactly as if all the particles are going out, but you reverse the charge uh, and you, 
um, you continue the trajectories of the incoming guys to be outgoing in the same way, right? So in other words, to find the radiation pattern for the first problem we're interested in, I solve a second problem where it's a bomb going off at the origin with these new directions and opposite charges. Okay, is that clear? All right, good. So now let's, now let's compute it. Well, we've already computed what f mu nu is. Uh, maybe before doing anything else, let's just get an idea of where is this big, right? So this event happened at the origin. There was radiation localized on the light cone. Now let's imagine these particles are coming out really fast, okay? They're all coming out near the speed of light, okay? With big, big boosts. So you sort of intuitively expect that the, that the radiation is going to be somehow localized in the direction that the particles are coming out. But let's try, to, let's try to be a little more quantitative about that. So the question is, when is x dot v small? Right? When x dot v is small is when we're making f mu nu big. So when is x dot v small? OK, well, <clears throat> let's say that v, this is a, remember, it's a velocity vector. So it squares to 1, but it can be cosh beta and cinch beta in some direction v hat. That's the direction the particle's moving in. x itself is r times 1 and x hat, just the unit vector that you're looking at. So what is x dot v? It's all just trivial stuff. So x dot v is over r, let me just factor out the r, is cosh beta minus cinch beta x hat dot v hat x hat dot v hat is just the cosine of the angle between where you're looking at and the direction of the particle, right? So x dot, right? And so this is, uh, so this is e to the beta 1 minus cos theta plus e to the minus beta 1 plus cos theta. And obviously, the only way this is going to have any prayer of being small is if cos theta is very close to 1, right? So that's, again, substantiating the obvious intuition that the radiation is mostly peaked in the direction the particle is moving in, but we're going to learn a little more quantitatively how much, okay? So this is roughly, <coughs> this is, if I factor out an overall uh, e to the beta, this is, uh, this is e to the beta, and there is a theta squared here over 2, plus 2 e to the minus 2 beta from this other piece. All right. Now, remember, e to the beta is the, is the energy over, uh, is e over m, the energy over the mass of the particle. So it's a measure of the boost. So this is roughly theta squared plus m over e squared. So we learned something interesting. This radiation pattern, when theta is much bigger than m over e, but still s small, right? m over e can be truly minuscule. If theta is bigger than m over e, uh, this f mu nu is getting more and more sharply peaked. The theta squared piece is dominating. So the radiation pattern is getting bigger and bigger as you head in towards, closer and closer towards the object. When you hit m over e, it flattens out, right? And inside, it just sort of stops uh, and being enhanced just by that much. So already we get this very nice picture that where is the radiation? Where is the radiation localized? So let's say I go back to the, to the original question. I have these two particles coming in, something happens, and then this is coming out this way, something is coming out that way. So first of all, these two guys are represented in my problem with something that is going that way and something that is going that way, so I can forget about the fact of where they came from. And secondly, well, let me, sorry, let me leave it. <laughs> Uh, but secondly, the radiation pattern is localized to a narrow cone around every guy. And the, and the size of that cone, the typical opening angle, is m over e. So that's a, that's a very pretty picture. There's radiation going out in the direction that the initial particles were coming in. <laughs> 
even though they're not there anymore. That's the initial state radiation. And we have this final state radiation. All right. So far, so good? Okay. Uh, so we can actually keep going with this position space picture a little bit. And um, maybe I'll actually tell you to do this as an exercise. I'll give you the answers, but you can uh, work them out uh, yourself as an exercise. So let's, let's see uh, how much energy this radiation carries. So to find the energy, we want to find the electric and magnetic fields, cross E cross B to make the pointing vector, and that'll tell us the flux through any uh, surface area. So what is the, what's the electric field? It's F zero I, so this is the electric field of the radiation. And, um, And well, we just wrote down the formula for f mu nu a second ago, so we can just read it off. This is just the sum over j q j <coughs> x hat minus b hat j over one minus b hat j dot x hat. The magnetic field is just the sum over j q j, just again from the formula that's on underneath this one, unfortunately, right now, is V cross X over one minus V hat J dot X. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, this is all multiplied by one over R delta of T minus R. Okay, this was sitting in front of everything. All right. So we can work out what is E cross B dot R hat. What's E cross B in the direction of R? First of all, there are these pieces. So this is one over R squared. There's a delta of T minus R, and there's a delta of zero, okay? So we'll deal with that delta of zero in a second. Um, so one of them is delta of zero, the other one just says that uh, that, uh, that T is equal to R, okay? So, sorry, so if I take this and I, and I, uh, and I, and I integrate uh, to get the flux through some service, that gets rid of uh, the, uh, that gets of that time delta function. And what I'm left with is uh, a sum over I and J of something that's obviously quadratic. So it's QI dot QJ. It's going to have our two denominator factors, one minus vj dot x, one minus vi dot x. And this is the interesting numerator factor, which is v hat i dot v hat j minus v hat dot x hat vj hat dot x hat. So that's a little exercise for you to work out. Okay, that's just what you get classically from the pointing vector. The one over r squared is the usual one over r squared dilution, okay, uh, of the flux through the area. Um, we'll come back to the delta of zero for a second, but now let's look at this piece a little more carefully. Um, and obviously it's biggest, again, in the sum, in the piece where i is equal to j, right, where we get the sort of biggest uh, enhancement. And so let's look at what that energy actually is that piece with i equals j, so we have, for the, we have for the flux, we have one over r squared, delta of zero, and then we have a sum over i, uh, qi squared. Now, the numerator is one minus cos squared theta, 
and the denominator is 1 minus cos theta squared. So this is otherwise known as 1 plus cos theta over 1 minus sine theta. Sorry, over 1 minus cos theta. OK. And so the total, the total energy uh, that we get is, goes like, um, well, so we have again, there's the, there's the, so R squared times, times the flux. It has our delta of zero. And we have a sum over I, but if I want to integrate, then I have to integrate d cos theta times this, this factor, right? And this is all happening in the neighborhood where, it's all happening in the neighborhood around where cos theta is equal to zero. Right? So in the neighborhood around where cos theta equals zero, d cos theta over one minus cos theta is like d theta over theta, right? So if I just go to that uh, close to theta equals zero, this is going with the sum of qi squared integral d theta over theta. All right. So. This shows our first, so there's a delta of zero, sum of i qi squared, and here we get our first logarithm, okay? And really, this is going all the way down to the theta, which is of order m over e, where this thing uh, turns around that we just talked about. So we get a logarithm of e over m. And this is coming from, obviously here, a collinear region. The radiation is very collinear with the uh, fast outgoing particle. Okay, so that's the total energy which is emitted. But what are we supposed to make of that delta of zero, right? Well, if we Fourier represent that delta, this is a delta of zero in time, right? This came from a, a time delta function. So delta of zero has units of one over time, which has units of energy, that's good, right? So uh, the whole thing is supposed to be and have units of uh, energy now. This was energy flux. So it's supposed to have units of energy. So that just means that what's setting the overall energy scale of what's coming out here is the energy of whatever the hard process was that we're not talking about that we, that we uh, resolved in that, in that point-like thing, in the point-like in, in point interaction. Said another way, this delta of zero is an integral over frequencies all the way up to some omega max which is really the scale of that hard process. Let me call it omega sub hard, okay? Okay, and so that's the total amount of energy which is emitted. So the energy is emitted very collinear to these particles with the initial and final state radiation, so these logarithmic singularities. And, um, and from this formula, we can also make a very good guess. This has been a completely classical problem. In a second, we're gonna do it quantum mechanically, okay? been a totally classical problem, but uh, we can make a good guess for the number of photons which is emitted, right? Because this is obviously to be interpreted as equal contributions from all the frequencies omega. So if I write this as d omega over omega times, and I put an omega up front here, okay, then uh, that's telling me how many photons have I emitted in total. The number of photons which has been emitted is there's one logarithm which can be relatively big, but it's cut off by the mass of the particle in this case. So that's the collinear piece. There's a Q squared. Of course, we have the sum over all the lines. So we have the sum over I QI squared. There's the collinear guy, but the second one also gives me a logarithm, which is a ratio of this hard scale to some soft scale. Okay? What is physically that soft scale in this problem? It's that, you know, I don't wait forever for every single one of the soft photons to come out for my detectors to be able to, uh, to uh, detect them. You know, I, I go home after lunch. So that puts, uh, that puts, that, that puts a cutoff to the, <laughs> to, the, to the photons that you're able uh, to see, right? So 
the number of photons that you will observe at very large distances will depend on how long you looked because uh, you know, some of them are going to come out at lower and lower frequencies. So it's not surprising that the number depends on that. Um, uh, but this is a measure for the, this is a measure for the number of photons which is emitted. And you see the number of photons has two logarithms in it, right? There's this collinear logarithm and there's this famous soft logarithm as well. All right, so that's a purely classical calculation. Any questions about this? So uh, as I said, the actual, as, as, as we'll talk about, the actual situation of the LHC is, is more interesting. Color is non-abelian is one factor. Something else that we're not taking into account is because we imagine these particles that are coming out are sort of big, heavy particles. We're not taking into account that the photons that are coming out can split into electron-positron pairs. So the splitting is also something we're not taking into, into, into this in this picture. But, uh, but the zeroth order physics is what happens. You collide things and most of the radiation is coming out within narrow uh, uh, regions uh, collimated around the initial and final particles. All right, now I want to do the quantum mechanical calculation. This I'll need a bigger piece of chalk. No, that's fine. All right. Normally, these computations in many field theory books, not, I mean, not in all of them, but in many, like in Peskin and Schroeder, this is done using Feynman diagrams, and there's some combinatorial analysis and it kind of seems like a little bit of a miracle that these double logarithms exponentiate and this, that, and the other, right? So, of course, everything does is perfectly correct, but I want to do it in, in a way that makes it dead obvious ahead of time what the answer is. So this is all, you know, undergraduate quantum mechanics. There's absolutely nothing fancy going on here whatsoever. So let's just, uh, all right, so, but let's, but let's at least set up the question that we're interested in. So we have some hard process, once again, so it's the same question, but in principle, we're now interested in seeing the quantum mechanical radiation pattern, which if we were summing diagrams, would come from summing all sorts of diagrams of this type. Some particles virtual, some particles emitted, and so on. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna solve a very general problem here, okay? Um, along the way, we might, uh, we'll, we'll pause actually and, uh, and uh, even get a nice general result of the sort that I was mentioning yesterday for why it is that the world is the way it is because it couldn't be any other way. Um, some of these arguments go back to Weinberg and this will be a particularly simple uh, arena in which we can see some of those uh, facts in action. So, uh, so in fact, I, I wanna make this particle anything. It's a, massless, it's a massless boson of some variety. So massless scalar, uh, gauge boson, photon, Graviton, in fact, we'll entertain that it can have any spin, spin 17, if you want. And we'll see why we can't have spin 17 in a second, okay? Uh, in any number of dimensions. Okay, so we wanna solve this, this problem. And what does solve the problem means? What we want is a formula for, we want a formula for, uh, we want the spin averaged, want the spin averaged probability for the following events. P0, no radiation emitted. P1, you emit one quantum, okay? So one quantum is, well, there's an integral over the phase space. And by the way, I'm gonna use this notation D slash uh, dk minus one to stand for everything, all the two pi's, all the omega downstairs. This is just the Lorentz invariant phase space, okay? Just so I don't have to keep writing it down, okay? So there's some that, p1 of k1, okay? And then, that's a different, and then dpn in general, which will be, sorry, it's just, just the differential, and dpn, which will just be a bunch of these, K1, d slash d minus one, Kn, 
time Pn that depends on K1 through Kn over n factorial. There's both statistics, so I stick the n factorial downstairs, okay? So P1 is the probability of emitting one quantum. P1 through Pn is the probability in that part of phase space for emitting n quanta. So we want a formula for that. That's the problem we want to solve. Okay, so let's start with a little preamble. Uh, which is to forget about this and just imagine we have a harmonic oscillator So there's some free Hamiltonian, which is omega a dagger a. Maybe with a, yeah, okay, with omega a dagger a. But it's kicked with a source. So I have a kick, which is h kick, is some j of t a plus j star of t a dagger. Okay? That's it. And I want to now solve j is zero for a while, then it kicks and turns on, and I want to solve what does a state look like at late times. So I solve the Schrodinger equation. It's i d psi dt equals h psi. As usual, it's convenient to go to the interaction picture. So I say psi is e to the minus i h naught t psi in the interaction picture. So psi in the interaction picture is i d psi dt is, now all that happens is that these a's now start oscillating with their phases, so it's j of t e to the minus i omega t a plus j star of t e to the plus i omega t a dagger acting on psi in this interaction picture. And so we can solve. Can you see? Uh, sure, can you not see? Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so psi then at infinite time, well, it's just the it's usual standard formula. It's a time ordered product of that mess, right? So this is just a time ordered product of e to the i integral from minus infinity to infinity dt j e to the minus i omega t a plus Hermitian conjugate, right? So that psi is this acting on the ground state, because I'm assuming that we start off in the ground state. All right, now, it's, this is a particularly trivial time order product to do, because these operators, the a and these don't commute with each other at different times, they don't commute with each other, but the commutator is a C number. The commutator is just e to the minus i omega t minus t prime. So when the commutator is a C number, you can just pull it all out as some factor, just a phase, and what's left, I just remove the T product. Okay, so this is just e to the i phi, something I'm not even bothered to calculate, we'll, but we'll calculate it in, in later, but we don't actually need to, uh, times just this operator, where I bring the, uh, uh, where I just write it as e to the i, just that. acting on the ground state. And this is otherwise known this is just e to the i phi, e to the i, the Fourier transform of j in frequency space, a plus j of w star, a dagger, acting on the ground state. Now, states of that form that look like e to the i alpha a plus Hermitian conjugate on the ground state, these are called coherent states. These are the famous coherent states, so the most classical-like states that we can have for the harmonic oscillator. So this is just e to the i phi times j tilde at omega. That coherent state. And this all makes, uh, this is exactly what you'd expect classically. This is just classical physics. Okay? I mean, this is just the doing classical physics and making the quantum state by declaring that it's that coherent state. After all, if we're solving this classical problem, if we're solving the classical problem of the harmonic oscillator, we would classically find it useful to introduce alpha 
is 1 over root 2 x plus ip. This is just for the classical problem. Alpha dot is equal to negative i omega alpha um, plus the kick plus j. That's the classical, that's the classical problem. And so, you know, alpha is starting, is starting there, it gets a kick, and then of course it's oscillating around and around after you're done, done kicking. We take out the e to the minus i omega t by going to the interaction picture, and what we're left with is just the final radius with which it's moving, right? And I just solve this equation if I define alpha i to be e to the i omega t alpha, and it's just exactly what we solved a second ago, and alpha i at infinite time is just exactly j tilde of omega. So this is just classical physics, it's just a standard statement we're doing, quadratic, <laughs> nothing fancy, essentially free, just turning on sources. The physics is classical, uh, but when we say the physics is classical, there's a quantum state there. The world is quantum mechanical, it's not classical. When we say it's classical, it means that we're making it the classical state, we're making a coherent state. So it's classical physics, but it's the quantum version of that classical physics that we make a coherent state. So what we can now do is just ask the question, how many, uh, 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 in this case we just have a harmonic oscillator, we can just overlap that with the end states and just see how many of each end state we get. Okay. Okay, so so if I, if, I, if I take any old coherent state, so if I define alpha to be e to the i alpha a plus Hermitian conjugate acting on the vacuum, then n alpha squared, this is just equal to, uh, well, this is n, uh, and if I just use uh, Bakel, Baker Campbell Hausdorff, that's alpha star a dagger e to the i alpha a, there's an e to the minus alpha mod squared over two from doing the commutator acting on the ground state squared. That's just the number that comes out, e to the i alpha kills that. On this side, that is equal to this thing uh, overlapped with the uh, ground state gives me, uh, well, so the whole thing mod squared gives me e to the minus alpha mod squared times alpha mod squared to the n over n factorial, okay? Remember, there are these root n factorials there, so that, that turns into that. And again, this is another famous standard fact. The statistics you get, the number of photons you get for n photons in a coherent state alpha is distributed according to a Poisson distribution, right? That's just the Poisson distribution. And the expectation value of the typical number of photons is just alpha mod squared, okay? So the expectation value of the number of photons is alpha mod squared. So this is Poisson with n equals alpha mod squared. Okay, so you're all happy about this, right? You've probably done the, this problem 17 times in, in your life five or six years ago, right? Okay, now we're done because if this is all that's going on in our problem, right? All that's going on is we're making this classical radiation. So before even writing down any formulas, let's just uh, let's just think <coughs> about what we should expect. <coughs> so we're making this big classical state. You know, I took this this thing and I kicked the ball, right? And it, it, the harmonic oscillator is sloshing back and forth. Of course, it is quantum mechanical. So if I look at there's some probability, for example, to still find it in the vacuum. But what is that probability? It's exponentially small. It's obviously exponentially small because you made this big classical state, right? So we should expect ahead of time, without doing any fancy calculations, uh, just intuitively, that the probability to stay in the vacuum is exponentially small, right? And that's what we're going to see in a second. Now we're gonna do the calculation, and we'll find that that exponential small has a nice structure. It goes like e to the minus alpha, and then there's two logarithms, and we'll understand where those two logarithms come from and so on. But it's just totally obvious ahead of time that we have this nice classical state, of course, the probability to stay in the vacuum is small. You've made all this classical radiation, right? But it's not zero. It's not zero because the world isn't classical. <laughs> it's uh, quantum mechanical, right? Okay, very good. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the undergraduate problem. So now let's, uh, now let's solve the problem that we care about. I'll probably just need 10 more minutes. Okay? 
Actually, I started about 10 minutes late. So. All right. So before we talk about, uh, before we use this picture to do our calculation, <coughs> let's just first talk about how we're going to, how exactly we're going to uh, couple our massless fields to all these lines that are coming out. So you'll notice I'm, I'm, I'm not using, I'm using the world line formalism and thinking about the actual particles coming out. Okay? So I'm just imagining the particles are, are, are coming out. What I'm treating quantum mechanically is the radiation. And I want to see what the, uh, what the quantum mechanical radiation pattern is. But if I have just a particle moving along, its own action is the m times the length of its world line. We're not going to care about that. What we care about is how it could couple to some other field. And I said, this could be a scalar, spin one, spin two, whatever. So what could it possibly look like? What could this action look like? Well, it could look like, and I'll call all the couplings G, the units and everything will, will be different, but, uh, but what it can look like is one, it could look like G times the integral along the world line of a scalar. That's for spin zero. It could look like G times the integral along the world line, the velocity dx mu by d tau times a vector. That's spin two. It can look like G integral along the world line, dx mu d tau, dx nu d tau, h mu nu, and so on. So just the, the dumbest thing, that, that's, that's what you could have. Those are the things that give you the most leading possible, biggest interactions that you can have. These are the interactions that, for example, survive in the non-relativistic limit. Okay? For instance, if I put a d squared x mu by d tau squared, I could also, uh, I could do more complicated things, right? Uh, but uh, they won't be as leading. This is the absolute most leading thing. In fact, it's these interactions that in the non-relativistic limit would give rise to a 1 over r to the d minus 3 potential. Right? So that's just, uh, uh, these are the interactions that would give rise to long range forces. All right. <clears throat> okay, but now, now, now we're done. So now we just have a collection of harmonic oscillators for these guys. The phi's, all these guys are just, a correct, are, are just a collection of harmonic oscillators. So we've just, we're just gonna get a, we're gonna get a coherent state, <coughs> and let's work out what that coherent state is, Ex exactly the same as we had before. We have a time-ordered product of this, the, in, the integral of whatever that interaction uh, Hamiltonian was in the interaction picture. As before, it's just some phase times the operator itself without the uh, time ordering in it. Okay. And now let's just remind ourselves in the various cases. Let's say it's a scalar. This would be th the field is just uh, the integral over its phase space, ak e to the minus ikx plus Hermitian conjugate. A mu would be the same thing but here we have the sum over polarizations, and there would be some epsilon mu of lambda, a of k and lambda, e to the minus i k x plus Hermitian conjugate. H mu nu would be the same thing with an epsilon mu nu that depends on the polarization or the helicity. These are massless particles, k and lambda, e to the minus i k x plus Hermitian conjugate. Very good. And so as before, we can now work out what is this operator? What is that s int? I'm just doing the integral along the world line, integral d tau, phi of x of tau, right? It's exactly like the calculation we did in the very beginning when we were computing the, I mean, these are just the currents of the straight lines, right? So uh, it's exactly the same calculation. So what is it? So, so let's again do s int. In the case of the scalar is just, again, the integral 
minus 1k. Now we have a sum of, because we have j lines, we have that coupling gj over i k dot vj, a k plus Hermitian conjugate, right? Uh, that's for spin zero. The other one, just some, has some extra factor, has some sum of gj, still got the same over ik dot vj, but I have vj mu dot the polarization vector, epsilon lambda mu, um, and then a lambda, and I'm summing over the polarizations, okay? Plus or minus conjugate. And in the case of the spin two, same gj, same old denominator. And I just have two v's upstairs. It's just vj mu, vj nu, epsilon lambda mu nu, a lambda plus Hermitian conjugate. Okay? So those are the operators that I have to exponentiate, and that gives me the coherent state that I make. So we just make these, these coherent states. Now let me just pause for a, a quick second before finishing, but just I can't resist because I'm right here. Right here we can actually learn something uh, remarkable about why it is that in nature we can only have these massless particles that mediate long range forces. They can be spin zero, they can be spin one, spin two, and we can't have any higher spins. And the reason for that has to do with what looks so innocent here, which is that we just wrote down polarization vectors for the massless particles of spin one, massless particles of spin two and higher. We pretend that such a thing as polarization vectors exist, but there is actually no such thing as a polarization vector for a massless particle of spin one. The difficulty is exactly, it only has two degrees of freedom. There's no way of describing two degrees of freedom for this massless particle in a Lorentz invariant way. You could say that there's a polarization vector that has four components, it's a four vector. You could say that maybe epsilon dot k is equal to zero. That puts one Lorentz invariant constraint knocked you down to three degrees of freedom, but that's still too many. To get two degrees of freedom, you just can't do it. Now you can say, well, what are you talking about? Uh, screw you. Uh, I'll just say the particle's moving in the z direction, and the polarization vector, if it's helicity this way, is zero, you know, one over root two, i over root two, zero. There, I'm done. What are you talking about? I say, great, great job. But the problem is that now your polarization vectors, even though you've put this mu index on them and you think they're a four vector, they don't transform like a four vector. <laughs> Go ahead and try. You'll find that if you define it that way, if you Lorentz transform it to another frame, they will no longer have that feature that for a particle moving in the z direction, they only have components in the x and y pieces. They'll also have a piece proportional to the momentum of the particle. That's the problem. If you take, there's no Lorentz invariant way of picking out two degrees of freedom. So this is where gauge redundancy comes in. This is where you have to declare that two polarization vectors that differ by something proportional to p mu are actually equivalent to each other, okay? They have to give you exactly the same physics. D depending on how you think about it, it's a consequence of Lorentz invariance, a consequence of unitarity, but it's the clash between the two of them. In, in my preferred way of thinking about it, in the Weinbergian way of thinking about it, the real problem is Lorentz invariance. You can define these four vectors all you want, but they're not Lorentz invariant in general. They'll transform into themselves, plus an inhomogeneous piece is proportional to the momentum. So the only way the physics is Lorentz invariant is if you make that shift on the polarization vector, nothing changes. Otherwise, the physics isn't Lorentz invariant, right? The S matrix, we just computed the S matrix in this trivial example, and it wouldn't be Lorentz invariant. So that means that if you take these epsilon, for example, here, if you replace epsilon by the uh, by the momentum of the particle, you had better get, you had better get uh, zero, okay? <coughs> um, so in this case, in this case, uh, what happens? If we replace epsilon with k, I get epsilon dot k, uh, sorry, I get k dot v that cancels k dot v. And so what I learn 
is that for spin one, Lorentz invariance, which is the proxy for what happens when you shift epsilon to epsilon plus anything times k, that this piece should give you zero. For spin one, we learn already something interesting, that the sum over gj has got to equal zero. That's charge conservation. Beautiful. So you, we can't couple these things to photons unless charge is conserved. For spin two, for spin two, we have to have that if I just take one of these and I replace it with k, that I still get zero. So I get four equations that depend on an, on an index. So what I get is that the sum over j of this coupling g j v j mu has got to equal zero. Right. Let me write this as a one over the mass of the particle, gj over mj, times the four momentum. This has got to equal zero. But now, naively, we're in big trouble, because the sum of the momenta is already zero. That's momentum conservation. So it looks like this is putting yet another constraint on the momenta other than momentum conservation. That would make it impossible for the particles to come in at generic angles. You can't have two different sets of linear combinations uh, vanish, right? So the scattering would vanish unless, unless and only unless this combination is independent of the particle, unless gj over mj is independent of the particle. So we have to have the gj is some universal number that I'll call one over m Planck times the mass of the particle. So we discover that we can have massless spin two particles, but they have to have universal coupling, and it's a principle of equivalence. They have to couple, in this sense, they have to couple proportional to mass, right? So that's very remarkable, right? Now putting in nothing other than the consistency of the massless spin two particle, we discover the principle of equivalence. Let's say we had spin three. Now you see what the problem is. If we have spin three, we'll get yet another factor of momentum out here. And now we really are screwed. There's nothing we can do. We get a quadratic constraint on the sum of the external momenta having to add up to zero, and that's just impossible. Okay? That is just, just impossible. So, um, so we can't have higher spins. We can't have spins three and higher. And these are the only spins we can possibly have. All right, anyway, so we are now all set up um, uh, to work out what the radiation pattern looks like uh, and get the rest of, uh, uh, and get the whole Sudikov story. Um, but let me think, um, yeah. I'm trying to think if I should do it now or maybe I should do it in the problem sessions. Um, what do you think, Michelangelo? Would you, are you a... Uh, Sorry? Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. So, so I think probably, maybe I'll just leave it here. Maybe I'll just leave it. Um, but, 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 but one thing that you should take out, one thing that, one thing, uh, one thing I will say, and then we, we can perhaps work through it in a, uh, in, in a problem session for the people who are, uh, interested. But, but something that, but the thing that I, I, I do want you to take away, which we can actually see already from putting together the pieces of the calculation that, that we did before, is A, it should not surprise you that the probability for not producing any particles is exponentially small, right? Because that's just the, that's just the standard coherent state overlap with the ground state. And B, we can even know how exponentially small it is. Because remember, we're, we're producing a coherent state. It has these Poisson statistics. So the amplitude to stay in the ground state is going like e to the negative, the expectation value of the number of photons that you produce. We computed the number of photons that you produce, at least from our classical approximation. And that went like e to the minus alpha, one logarithm, which was the soft log, and one logarithm that was this collinear logarithm. Okay? When we do this analysis in a general number of dimensions, you see the collinear logarithm is always there in any number of dimensions. That's a feature of radiation. That's really just the fact that you're, you take the Coulomb field and you're boosting the hell out of it, 
Okay, so the fact that you get the collinear divergence is universal in any number of dimensions. The fact that we get the soft logarithm is special to four dimensions is, is you know, related to the dimensionlessness of the coupling constant and all of the rest of it. But the amplitude not to produce any particles is exponentially small. It goes like e to the minus alpha collinear log times the soft logarithm. And furthermore, but the actual amplitude not to produce any particles depends on, on how long you're willing to wait, right? If you're willing to wait to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, if you're willing to wait forever, the number of photons we produce is infinitely large, so the probability to stay in the vacuum is zero, okay? If you wait till lunch or until now and quit the lecture and quit measuring the photons, that, that's giving a, your resolution, that's the sort of famous resolution of the uh, detector, right? Uh, and so, so the probability of not producing anything up to the time you looked is finite. Uh, and is cut off by the resolution of the detector for this very good reason, okay? And it's just the, anyway, it's a, it's a very small little nice exercise to do the rest of it for whoever's interested, just to see how these coherent state manipulations are reflected in the actual Feynman diagram calculations and how the uh, two of them uh, match up with each other. All right, but okay, uh, that's all, thanks.